politicians, we need, the world needs to do something fast to combat climate change. The third part of the really inconvenient truth, as I keep saying, Al Gore made a film called Inconvenient Truth, but the issue of climate change is not the inconvenient truth. The real inconvenient truth is that the poorest who are not responsible for climate change are the worst impacted. And that the developing world will lose the development dividend. All our countries are investing huge amount of effort, money into building um, 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 in, in its fight against poverty. And yet every time we get more variable rainfall, every time we get a flood or we get a drought, we essentially end up losing the development dividend. We make the poor even more vulnerable. And that is an issue that we need to put very clearly on the global stage so that no longer can we be told that climate change will happen. We need to tell the world climate change is happening, we are victims of climate change and we need the world to do a lot more to fix the problem. So that is one thing that we clearly find. We will discuss this in the afternoon today. Roxy is there, Arjuna is there, we have colleagues from Philippines, colleagues from Africa who will tell you the kind of impacts that we are beginning to see today with changes in weather. And uh, Chandabhushan, after I speak, is going to talk a lot more about this. But I know, traveling across India today, we are beginning to see what I call the face of despair today. These are seasons of despair across, at least India I know, where farmers are being hit by unseasonal rain, by hailstorms when they would not expect it. So this year they have had hailstorms when there was crop standing in North India, crop was hit, devastated, so that they had no crop left. So we have two seasons in, the, in India, we have the winter crop and the summer crop or the monsoon crop. And the winter crop was ready for harvesting. And in March and April, we got such unseasonal rain and hailstorm that that crop was devastated. Then we got a drought, partly linked to El Nino. But then what we've also seen is that farmers invested, put in a lot of effort to get their crop again for summer, for the monsoon. And in September, in many parts of India, and I have recently been to villages in India where I have seen huge areas of devastation because again when the crop was standing ready for harvesting they've had unseasonal rain extreme rain in parts where i have been i have seen rain that has happened half the year's rainfall has come in five hours five hours and so you've seen huge devastation happening so i don't think the world needs to tell us climate change is going to happen we know that it is happening we also know that it is happening because of what is known as the greenhouse effect. As Arjuna said, there's, we all know what is climate change. But when I am asked to describe it and say what is climate change, and Yuba being at IPCC will give you a much more accurate scientific version of it. I call it very clearly that just think about it as if the earth is used to have one blanket because we used to have a natural effect in which the solar radiation was reflected back. But today, what we have is two blankets, three blankets, four blankets. And you're trapping the heat more and more. And as you're trapping the heat, you're leading to temperature changes that are happening. Now, the reason is very clear that you have gases which are released. Um, CO2 is the big gas, carbon dioxide, you have methane. You have nitrous oxide, you have other gases which are released annually. But the trick was that the earth has a capacity to clean it. So you have natural absorption that happens. You have the forest, the oceans, the land, um, the atmosphere that would actually clean these gases. But today we have outstripped the capacity. So we are releasing a lot more and we do not have the capacity to clean. In fact, we have a capacity to clean a very small proportion of the gases that we are releasing. And the 
problem also is that you have these gases have a very long life particularly carbon dioxide once emitted it stays in the atmosphere for over 100 150 years other gases have a shorter life but as i said what is not cleaned naturally by sinks the forest the oceans or atmosphere stays and this then forces you keep hearing of these terms i'm particularly sort of disaggregating some of these terms because we keep hearing of climate forcing in my view it just means forcing which is concentration increases and this forces temperatures to rise emissions this is chart from ipcc emissions equals concentration because the amount of emissions in the atmosphere the life of the emissions is long they get concentrated which then in turn leads to temperature increase so you have the temperature increase which is likely based on the amount of emissions that we will release the other thing that is very clear and i don't think there is any today any two views about this is that it is human made it is anthropogenic that these emissions are the highest in history that we have never seen this kind of concentration it is unprecedented and that as a result of it the warming of the climate system is unequivocal these are words from ipcc these are now absolutely established science so other than the tea party and the republicans in the united states i think everyone else accepts it very interesting uh, tomorrow we will discuss it but our report that we've done on the united states which i said no western media wants to write about but uh, both chandrabhushan and i are featuring very much on the tea party blogs right now so it is an interesting part of the way um, this discussion moves on and it's also very clear that we are breaching new grounds we have reached 400 ppm in 2013 what is also very clear is that emissions have increased if you look at this fossil fuel is the key reason for these emissions forestry and other land use changes are have have remained from 1980 because in the past it was forestry and land use changes which led to emissions in the atmosphere and as i said please think about carbon dioxide is the gas which never dies it's a 150 year old gas so if it is emitted in 1850 it still survives and that's why you can't say that what the americans did many years ago they should we cannot hold them responsible because that gas is still in the atmosphere so that is the big challenge of climate change which is what is called the historical burden of countries which is also what we often call is the natural debt of countries that countries overuse their share of the global atmospheric space they have a natural debt which like a financial debt needs to be paid and this chart shows it very clearly that the emissions have continued to increase from 1900 but the big change has come between 1950 to now the beginning of the industrial revolution the big changes in the way people emitted and released gases all this so the emission increase is this these are charts from ipcc clearly showing that this emission really increase is related to rising concentration and this is what the concentration the measurements in atmosphere of these gases show as far as co2 nox as well as methane is concerned and this then is the third part of the the story is the temperature increase so you have the emissions the concentration and then the temperature link and the temperature increase till now is 0.85 degrees centigrade between 1880 to 2012 and the last three decades have been the warmest ever known so that information is out there clear we don't need to repeat we don't need to question it the question now is what do we do 75 percent of this warming is also because of carbon dioxide so that is the big gas that needs to be discussed long life gas also comes from economy so the other issue that we need to be clear about is that when our countries discuss climate change they are not discussing ecology 
In fact, it is often strange for me that climate change negotiations are seen as soft negotiations and that trade negotiations are seen as hard negotiations. So when people go to WTO, the big dadas go to WTO, okay? And all our countries are very worried about the negotiations that happen at WTO. And climate negotiations are seen as soft negotiations. Hey, environmentalists will go for it. Actually, when you are negotiating climate change, you are negotiating economic growth. So you are not negotiating ecology, you are negotiating your right to development. And the reason is that no country in the world, no country in the world, and please be very clear about this because we are constantly being told, don't make the mistakes that we have made. So I'm constantly being told, I was in Paris day before and everyone in Paris constantly telling me, oh, you should not do what we did. You should find a different path. And the fact is, they have, when they know that no country in the world has actually reinvented growth so that you can grow without pollution. No country in the world has still built a low carbon economy. And therefore, the issue is that action still is too little and it is too late. We signed a convention in 1992. I was in Rio in 1992 when the convention was signed, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I always say that was the age of innocence. Also, I was much younger. But uh, <laughs> it was also the age of innocence where we all went to Rio believing very strongly that we could do something to change the way the world uh, consumed, the way the world produced, and the way the world would emit. And yet today, when we are on our way to Paris, many years after the Rio conference, the story is that we are not doing enough, that we are not being able to bridge what is today called the gigaton gap. And it is important for us to say this because, as I said, we are victims of climate change. We are not deniers of climate change. We know climate change is happening and we have to demand more from the world, particularly the rich world. So 25 years later, the world is still finding excuses not to act. And the reason is economy is on the line. This chart tells you that the emissions are related to economy. The bulk of the emissions are related to the economic sectors, whether it is transport, industry, energy. Energy is the big reason. Whether it is coal, whether it is gas, whether it is um, um, petroleum products, which are used today for all our transport purposes. So it's energy which is at the core of the climate change debate the world still remains addicted to fossil fuels. It has not moved its economies out of fossil fuel into renewables. So the energy system of the world continues to be the single largest emitter as far as greenhouse gas emissions are concerned. And this is when we know that growth has to be reinvented. The scale of transformation that is required means that we have to reinvent growth. The energy basket has to be changed from fossil to non-fossil. Consumption has to be drastically reduced. I am um, again jumping to this report we have done, but as all researchers, the latest thing that you have done is always what is in your mind. Um, we will show you tomorrow our critique of the United States and what comes out very clearly from our critique is that the U.S. consumption is out of control and that U.S. lifestyle therefore has to be on the table, it has to be negotiable. That the U.S. government's entire approach to climate has been to improve efficiency of its cars, of its buildings, of its uh, energy system. But every time they have invested in improving efficiency, they drive more, they build bigger buildings, and as a result of it, their emissions continue to rise. So you need to bring this back on the table so that the world cannot come to Paris and say, oh, we are all very good boys, 
and a few girls and we have done it and we have managed to save the world they have not managed to save the world and it's something that we need as south the south to put on the table as i said we need so soft options is where the world is invested right now all the negative things that it could do without a cost but the things that have a cost to it those options are still not being used by anyone in the world the other part of this debate and that's something that concerns us the most is that growth has to be shared climate change is really about the fact that not only has the world emitted and that has led to temperature increase but that you have one atmospheric space and that we live on one planet we all talk about an interdependent world yet climate change brings that to us much more clearly because what it tells you is that not only do we have to reduce emissions but we have to do it in a way that we can share the pain of both the impact of climate change but also reduction in a way that the poor countries of the world are not asked to reduce while the rich countries in the world don't take on the burden of transformation so growth has to be shared and the reason is growth is linked to emissions and so for the first time you're saying growth is on the line and that growth has to be shared across the world the agreement at rio was that the rich will reduce so that the poor can grow okay it was about creating ecological space and yet what we have seen and what you will see in paris is every attempt to freeze inequity so the question is who is emitting how much who is responsible now if you look at current emissions the 2012 data what is very clear is that china is obviously the largest annual emitter in the world today so there is the, the, you can't deny that it is overtaken the united states as far as annual emissions are concerned and i'm constantly emphasizing annual because there are many ways of measuring who emits who is responsible but china is the highest annual emitter after the us today which was the highest annual emitter for many years european union comes third india comes fourth it is 6% of the annual emissions of the world so if you look at it more simply china is 26% us is 17% eu is 13% india is 6.5% russia is 5.5% so when the western media says that india is the fourth highest polluter they are not wrong on an annual term yes india is the fourth highest polluter it's also interesting when you compare it to china uh, to africa and you put all the indian emissions together then what is also clear is that the whole of africa is equal to the indian emissions on an annual basis okay so please understand the inequity firstly look at this table you will get an idea when i talk about it even in billion terms china is 8.3 billion terms billion tons us is 5.4 billion tons which is 5% of the world population india is still 2.1 billion tons So yes we are the fourth highest polluter but look at it in terms of scale 8 5 and 2 and then when you take africa and you take all of africa together you realize that all of africa all of africa and remember south africa is the highest as far as africa is concerned but if you take all of africa it's equivalent to india so on an annual basis this is what the story is but as i said the story is not about annual emissions the temperature increase that is happening today is happening because of the concentration of gases in the atmosphere the concentration of gases in the atmosphere is because of the age of gases which live in the atmosphere so when they have been emitted how much is already in the atmosphere that is responsible for temperature increases so in climate change you should never look at annual figures you should look at how much has been the cumulative 
emissions of countries which are in the atmosphere today as i said a ton of co2 emitted 100 years ago is the same value so we have put together the data and that shows you 7 out of every ton of co2 emitted has been emitted from the rich countries between 1840 to 2006 data right cb this is this the next one i know is more up to date um this chart is what i'd like to concentrate on now this tells you therefore what is the cumulative emissions and who is responsible for it if you look at this between 1850 to 2011 the data is very clear the united states is singularly responsible for 21% of the total emissions which are in the atmosphere up to 2011 5% of the world population 21% of the emissions that they are responsible for south africa is responsible for 0.9% russia for 7.4 japan for 3.3 india for 2.8% of the emissions EU 28 which is all together EU is 18.4% of the emissions China which is said to be the highest annual emitter and it is but on a cumulative basis till 2011 is responsible for 10.7 or 11% of the emissions that are in the atmosphere and the rest of the world 28% all of africa combined including south africa which is about a percent so the rest of africa all together is about 3.3% so you get an idea of the inequities of this and this is important to keep in mind because this is a picture people would like us to erase from our minds i mean there is a lot of things that the world would like us to erase of the past but one of the environmental stories that they would like to erase is the historical injustice as far as climate change is concerned i am constantly told by very senior people let's not discuss this this is inconvenient because we can do nothing about the past let's only talk about what is going to happen in the future so let's write this off and let's talk about the future it's not that easy because as i said the right to global atmospheric space is the right to development it is not the right to pollute it is the right to development so we need to discuss this because we need to secure our right to development for the future now let's take a look at it from a per capita point now per capita is only annual emissions these are not historical this is what you are doing today how many people do you have today now if you look at it from a per capita view then the us is 17 tons per capita per year 17 tons per capita per year australia is 19 canada is 16 russia is 12 India is 1.6 now probably a little more uh the data we do not have the latest but we are probably around 2 tons uh per capita today um um so that's the inequity and the injustice we are talking about so essentially and this is where i want to leave this issue and um ask uh, chandrabhushan to take over is that climate change is about the economy not ecology i want to conclude by saying that climate change is about dividing this carbon budget and you will hear a lot more about the carbon budget and uh, csc when we began talking about the carbon budget uh, at one of the earlier conference of parties we actually baked we actually got a cake baked and we went to the conference of parties and we had this big cake and we got a hold of a northern um, uh, negotiator and we said look this is the share of the cake that you are eating today and you have to be very clear that's the negotiations that are happening today and will happen in paris climate negotiations are about the carbon budget how much the world can emit to stay below 2 degrees because that's the big challenge that we cannot emit beyond 2 degrees uh, centigrade so we have now a limited carbon budget as i said we already have emitted an increased temperatures 0.8 uh, 
five degrees centigrade. Um, uh, we have another amount of emissions which are already in the atmosphere, which will inevitably lead to um, uh, temperature increase, which is another 0.85. That will already that ha is already given. So now we have a short window to stay below two degrees centigrade, and the big issue is who will occupy this remaining space and how will the world account for the space that is already be taken up so that we can stay below 2 degrees centigrade we can keep temperature rise to a level which at least does not lead to runaway impacts and even more devastation and that's the challenge for paris now thank you